Well, back to our top story this hour and the Chinese leader's visit to the Russian capital. For more analysis on uh, the president of China's visit, let's uh, go now live to Washington, D.C. Richard Weitz, he's the director of the Center for Political Military Analysis at the Hudson Institute there in Washington. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Now, uh, clearly we've seen a very warm welcome for China's leader here in Moscow, but this major deal, this gas deal he's here to seal, is yet to be signed off. Uh, there is a question of price here. Do you think that could be a stumbling block between the two? Yes, this is the, the big uh, just difference we've seen between the oil and the gas deals. The oil deal, they came pretty, they were able to use world market prices for the most part. And so it's just a question of how much China would lend money, money rush to Russia to build the pipelines. With gas, it's a bit more complicated because the pricing is a bit uncertain. You've got, you, you've got LNG playing a greater role. You've got shale gas. So either you, you can, pay, if you're the Chinese, you can think of scenarios in which the price should be lower because you can also get the material from the, 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 oil, the gas from the, from the LNG. The Europeans will buy less because of shale. If you're the Russians, well, then you want to get world market prices. You can think where you could maybe send the, the gas gas to Japan or South Korea. So it's a bit more complicated, a bit more uncertainty in the price, and therefore this is why you're seeing this haggling. Now, let's talk about the, the, the political and diplomatic uh, ratifications here, ramifications, I should say. What does this strengthening of relations between the two tell us about the shift of focus and, of course, influence eastwards? And it comes just after the summit of the Shanghai Group of Nations, the uh, SCO, the Shanghai Corporation Organization Summit. Yes, this has been a, a, a priority focus of Russian diplomacy in, in recent years to try and develop further uh, Russia's ties with Asia. For a while, Russia was a bit isolated uh, in, in terms of the, it was a bit, it was frozen out of some of the East Asian institutions, some of the East Asian prosperity developments, economic developments. Um, but with the decision to hold the APEC summit in Vladivostok, with uh, very active diplomacy on the part of President Putin, now President Yedev, Russia is clearly showing greater interest in Asian affairs. And the Chinese, of course, consider Russia an important partner. Uh, we've mentioned the oil and gas. Uh, there's also nuclear energy cooperation, a lot of shared security interests. So it's uh, it'd be expected, and, and the, 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 the two leaders have this phrase, which I, which I tend to uh, think is an apt description of the relationship. They, think it's, they describe it as being the best ever between Moscow and Beijing under their various governments. That's probably true. Um, now, admittedly, that's not necessarily a very high metric because of the long history of tensions between the two. But it's, I think, really, they have made a lot of progress in overcoming some of their differences in recent years. You're there in Washington. Is Washington a little uneasy about... Uh this developing relationship? No. Uh, there was a time after the Cold War uh, when people were watching this. There was a, an expectation that you would see China and Russia balance uh, the United States uh, because of the, the superpower hegemony issue and various others. What we've seen is we've seen some cooperation. But for the most part, the two countries tend to pursue parallel policies and with, with very minimal coordination between them. So, for example, in the case of Iran, in North Korea, on missile defense, a whole range of important issues, they tend to have the same position, very overlapping, but they don't tend to act in unison. So it's not really been a fear of a Russia-China alliance against the United States. It just hasn't really developed that way. And you could see why. I mean, both countries have very important relationships with the United States. They don't want to endanger. So we have to go worry about going back to the triangular diplomacy of the Cold War. What about across the Atlantic? Uh, should Europe be concerned about Russia turning its attention eastwards? Uh, after all, is perhaps some may, people may say that Russia's turning its back on crisis-stricken Europe and looking elsewhere. Um, Europeans, uh, I mean, the main concern they have, of course, is access to Russian oil and gas, uh, and the, not only from Russia itself, but it's passing through. I, I think the Europeans, if anything, are even, even less concerned. I mean, their, their relationship with China is less conflictual than the U.S. relationship. Uh, and there is, of course, one exception to uh, what we, we've been discussing about this tendency to have a loose coalition. It's more, I think, Central Asia, and you mentioned the Shanghai Summit. That's really the one area where you see very strong, close coordination. Uh, and for the most part, they haven't pursued necessarily anti-American policies. They're, they're, for the moment, they're accepting the NATO, uh, Euro European, and Western role there because of the concern about the, the Afghanistan. 
there is a, a tensions over human rights and perhaps over anti-terrorism. But for the most part, that's an area where they work closely together and not necessarily uh, driving out the West. So I think uh, Europeans, like the Americans, are watching this relationship, but they're not, no one, we're not alarmed yet. Just finally, you touched on a very interesting point, mentioning NATO security matters. Uh, in your capacity as a specialist in political military analysis, China's military has been beefed up somewhat in recent years, hasn't it? The defense budget is rising every year. Why? Well, what's China preparing for? Is it under threat? Well, this is an, a puzzle we all have in Washington. I had the opportunity to be in, in Russia two weeks ago for the Valdai conference in, in, in Moscow. And we met very senior people in the defense ministry, uh, both civilian and military. And I kept on asking this question about, well, isn't Russia's considered the, the puzzlement, the concern that many Americans have? And for the most part, I got the, the, the straight answer we usually do, which is no. Uh, Russia's watching this, doesn't consider China a threat, at least for the next decade or so. If anything, they consider China's rise to be stabilizing. So, in a way, Russia's dampening the kind of uh, any effort to form an anti-Chinese coalition. But we're actually seeing a lot of uncertainty on the smaller countries part now, Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, uh, Laos, there's a lot of concern about China. They're going to be there in the first wave of any ex Chinese expansionism. And some of these are very close relations with Russia. So Russia might be drawn into this kind of effort and trying to... Uh, China isn't a threat, but it's a, it's a problem. We've always had problems in the world whenever there's been a rising power uh, that tries to, to in, as they naturally do, imply their economic strength into some kind of greater international expansionist role. Sometimes it works out okay, such as when Britain passed leadership to the United States. Often it doesn't, such as when we, we just couldn't deal with the rise of Germany other than divide the country into two. Very interesting to hear what you have to say. Thanks so much for your time. Richard White's joining us live there in Washington. Thanks.